I, what I wanted you to do to start is to introduce a speaker tonight. So it's Dr. Simon Waldman, um, who's here to talk about future think a little bit about tidal energy development and what might happen, uh, some of the implications if it uh, um, um, really commercializes. And you know, it looks like we're at the, that point um, at the moment. Um, I'm not here to give a press to the to the talk, but the speaker. Um, Simon's you know, an interesting professional career. I think a physicist originally. Um, uh, originally, yeah. Yeah, I'll maybe let you do your introduction. <laughs> but being uh, studied here as an MSc student in... 2010-11. 2010-11, I suppose you should have known that. Um, then finished the PhD with us, then had a brief sojourn to the, the States and to work in the Pacific Northwest lab. Yeah, actually. And then the University of Hull before returning to Orkney last year. Um, and is a, he's now a, a, an assistant lecturer in uh, renewable energy here at uh, Heriot-Watt University. So I think that's probably quite enough for me at the minute. I'll hand you over to Simon, and I'm sure we'll be in for an interesting talk, and uh, there'll be some time for questions at the end. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sandy. Thank you. So this is, this is according to the slides here in your talk, but it's mostly an old talk, um, which I haven't given in Orkney before, um, because it's about some research that I did in collaboration with uh, actually Sandy and others during that period when I wasn't here. Um, it was originally meant to be about a 20-minute presentation. I'll try and stretch it a bit. I apologise if we have a rather short session, but I don't think it'll be too bad. Um, what this came out of was I often try to think ahead a bit, not to what industry is looking at right now, but if things, if things are successful, if things scale up as we hope, what are the problems we're going to have to deal with in 10 or 20 or 30 years time? Um, and there's no new science in this work. There's no new physics, at least. Um, but I had this realization in about 2018 that there were lots of publications over the previous decade about the physics of tidal energy, which by that point we understood quite well. And that these physics had implications for policy. Nobody had really told the policymakers. It was all discussed in the footnotes of technical papers that policy people would never read. Yeah. So this is some work we did um, exploring those implications. So what I'm going to do today is spend about the first half of the time giving you an introduction to the physics in question, aimed at non-specialists, do not worry, and then explore some of those implications and some ideas as to how we might address those implications. And there's a few things to get out of the way here first. Um, well, the two things I'm going to get across to you in terms of physics, I hope. The first is there is no simple trade-off between the energy output of a tidal array and its environmental impact. It's not a simple case of the more energy, the more impact. And I'll come on to that a bit later and hopefully demonstrate why that is. And the second is that if you have multiple tidal farms, large tidal farms in the same region, they are going to affect each other. So we have to think about the coordination between them and we have to think about liability issues between them. Mm. What I'm not talking about here is the wakes immediately behind turbines. Wakes are important and they're a very live topic right now. Uh, for the first time in the world ever in the next couple of years, we are going to have, I think, three different developers deploying tidal turbines in, in very close proximity in the fall of Warness. Wakes are going to be very important there, and I know a number of those developers are looking at that in a lot of with a lot of interest. Um, so this is not about the wakes immediately behind the turbine where you have slower speed. This is a slightly bigger picture, um, and it's probably not going to matter with the first turbine or the first five turbines or the first ten turbines. This might start to matter if we manage to scale up to having hundreds of turbines or thousands of turbines in the pattern of birth, for example. That's not to say the wake stuff isn't important. It is. It's just it's looking at a slightly different scale. Um, the last thing to say is I'm going to talk a lot about environmental impact. What I mostly mean by environmental impact here is changes to the flow, changes to where the water is going and how fast it's doing it. Now, people don't really directly care about that unless maybe they're in a kayak. Um, but of course, changes to the flow will also have a knock-on effect in changes to ecology and biology and things that people think matter. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that at this stage because that's not my expertise. Just talking about the changes to the physical flow. Okay, so 
The first thing we want to talk about is this idea that there isn't a simple trade-off between the energy output and the environmental impact. Before we get there, I want to talk about how we lose energy from a tidal channel. So here is a cartoon of a tidal channel on the right. We have our, our water flowing from the bottom to the top, and we have a tidal farm here marked as A. Uh, now, in reality, this, this, if this is a large tidal farm, it's going to have multiple rows. But to simplify it here, it's one dotted line, which we can assume as a line of turbines. Now, some of the water going through the turbines, there is water going through the turbines, and that has kinetic energy. And some of that kinetic energy is going to be removed. It's going to be extracted by the turbines. That's the point. That's what we're trying to do. We want to take that kinetic energy from the flow and to turn it into electricity. Because we are removing that energy, we're going to slow down the flow. So that's one, one place where our energy is being removed, is A is at the turbine rotor. Now, that tidal farm forms a partial blockage to the water. And if you think about how you intuitively understand water, you know if you put a partial blockage in its place, it sees that resistance and it goes around it. Some will still go through, but some will go around. So what I've marked as B here is flow that would have gone through this bit of water if the tidal farm wasn't there, but instead it accelerates around the tidal farm instead. And because that's accelerating, that has more friction with the seabed and going to start to lose energy because of that. So we lose energy with, in friction with the seabed because of the flow diverting around the tidal farm. And that's our second way of losing energy. Don't worry, this is about as technical as it's going to get. Please do not be concerned. Now at that point, behind the tidal farm, we have the wake here. We have a low speed behind the tidal farm. And we have the high speed of the water that's diverted around the tidal farm. So low and high speed running next to each other. These are going to mix together over some distance. And as they do that, there will be turbulence. And that turbulence turbulence is a, is a way of losing energy. Turbulence takes energy. So some, the energy has to go into powering the turbulence effectively. And eventually that gets dissipated as heat. So this is another way we lose energy from the channel as a whole. So we've got three ways of losing energy from our tidal channel, all as a result of the presence of the turbines. But only A, the energy actually at the turbine rotors, is available to be turned into electricity. The rest is just lost. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but the important point to take away here is that that ratio of the energy we can get out at the turbine to the total energy lost, that is not fixed. And if we do this well, we can get out a large proportion of the energy. If we do it badly, we might only get out a small proportion of the energy that is being lost from the channel. This will become important later. <clears throat> Here's a little bit of a demonstration of that, um, demonstration of why I think we need strategic planning of where we put our tidal farms. Uh, this is going to be a rather ridiculous example um, of very stupid tidal developers. Um, this is to keep, to keep a nice, simple example. So we have an, a channel here uh, running from left to right, which has two islands in it. And a tidal developer comes along and decides to build a tidal farm here. And as expected, there's now a bit less flow in the channel with the tidal farm. As we explained, it's partly blocked. Some of the water will go to the far side of the island. But our, our tidal developer is not an idiot. He's accounted for this in his plans, and he has made sure that he's still going to make a decent profit with the flow that is still going through that channel. Now, at the same time, maybe maybe a month later, but planning at the same time, a different company has come along, looked at the same channel, and thought, well, I'm going to put a tidal farm here. Oh, dear. So now neither one is making very much energy, but we're having this massive acceleration of flow around them, which is probably having environmental impacts. That's not what we want. Of course, what they should do is build opposite sides of the same island. That way, each tidal farm is preventing the flow from diverting around the other. So they support each other, and both of them will make a lot more power with less environmental impact. So, but to do that, 
we have to have some planning so that each of them knows what the other one's going to do. Now, this is obviously a very simple and ridiculous example. But if you scale it up to a larger archipelago, we start to realize it's not that straightforward. We can demonstrate this, this need a little bit. We can demonstrate that this matters. Um, this is some work that some colleagues uh, with Marine Scotland Science did back in 2017. Um, <clears throat> I would emphasize here that these are scenarios of the Pendleton Firth, which are way beyond anything anyone's going to build. They are looking at the theoretical maximum energy that's available, which is never going to be economically viable. I emphasize this because the, some of the effects look a bit scary here. Um, what we're showing is the change in water levels, the change in tidal amplitude, as a result of getting a mean power of 1.4 gigawatts out of the Pentland Firth. Both of these different set of scenarios get the same power, but as you can hopefully see on this slightly weird projector, this one has much, much bigger impact than this one does, thanks to different arrangements of the turbines. So this is a demonstration of what I was saying at the start, saying we're gonna get 1.4 gigawatts of electricity, doesn't tell us how big the environmental impacts are going to be. We can get it right and have fairly small impact, or we can get it wrong and have much larger impact. I'll emphasize again, this is not anything that anyone's proposing. I emphasize this because it suggests about a 20, cent about a 20 centimeter rise in sea level in Stromness, which we don't want. So that's one thing. That's, that's trying to get across the idea that if we get things right, we can get a lot of power for a modest impact. If we get things wrong, we can get small amounts of power for lots of impact. But getting it right probably requires that strategically planned approach. The second point on the physics is that tidal arrays are going to affect each other if they're big enough. So in 2019, we were working on this. We identified three setups here, which pretty much capture um, Almost any real situation will break down into one of these or a combination of these. So we might have a channel with two tidal farms that are upstream and downstream of each other. That's really straightforward. It, you're almost, but not quite, like two dams on a river doing hydroelectricity. Um, so if these two farms have the same power as each other, they're probably going to get about half the power each. It's going to be divided between them. <clears throat> the second scenario is something that's quite different to other power sources that only really happens in tidal to any great degree. And we just covered this, in fact, with the islands. If we have two tidal farms A and B next to each other across a channel, they will help each other. They will support each other because each one is preventing the water from going around the other one. And that has some interesting consequences, which we'll come on to later. And there, can, there can be a beneficial relationship between different tidal developments. We can see here that if you take B away, suddenly A gets less power. <laughs> Third of all, we can have our two tidal farms in parallel channels separated by an island. And there are some details, but in general, that behaves quite similarly to the side by side. It's almost the same scenario. There can be some differences depending on the geometry of the islands. So that's, that's kind of the, the theoretical side of it. Once again, this has been demonstrated through some modeling. Um, and this is modeling that was done 10 years ago now. Um, as I said, there's no new physics in here. It's just that people haven't really explained it to anybody. So on the map over here, we have the Pentland first. Here's Kate Ness, here's South Ronaldsey. And <clears throat> excuse me, this research team have uh, drawn a number of lines on the map where they've put turbines into their model. Um, so in particular, I want to focus on B, C, and D here. So B, uh, for those who can't see my laser pointer online, B is running between Caithness and Stroma. C is the outer sounds between Stroma and Swona. And then D is closing the gap between Swona and South Ronaldsey. So between them, they cover the width of the Pendant Firth. And Draper et al. did simulations of each of these by itself and also of all of them together. And the results are down here. And I'm not asking you to go through the numbers in detail, but let's pick B, for example. B by itself, and they're looking here at the theoretical maximum power you could get from these channels. So probably not a realistic amount, economically. B by itself, they reckon, would provide about 122 megawatts. 
B by itself, no, sorry, B, if C and D are also operating, can provide 320, almost three times as much. And the same thing happens, C by itself going to get about 1.4 gigawatts. C, if the others are in place, 2.3 gigawatts, and yeah. so on and so forth. So each of these benefits enormously from the others also being in place and operating. Because again, otherwise the water will, some of the water will simply divert. If we put a lot of power in the inner sound, as May Jen are planning to, some of that flow is going to divert through the outer sound, for example. They also, we also can look at E here, which goes between the Pentoscaries and South Ronaldsey, and that's much more like the upstream downstream scenario that we had. In this case, they showed that E by itself does quite well, but if the others are operating, then E gets less because that's the same energy flux going through both sets of turbines. So this is the demonstration in a numerical model that these large tidal arrays can affect each other when they're in parallel channels. And in particular, the BCD, that these arrays in parallel channels can benefit each other. Simply by having the other ones operating, we would get more power from each array. So that broadly makes sense to everybody. Okay, I'm seeing some nods, this is encouraging. Okay, now this has some implications. This is where it gets a bit interesting. And this is the stuff that we actually came up with. So we're going back to these diagrams here. We have our upstream downstream scenario here again. And now we put some smiley faces into it. Our tidal farm A is operating quite happily. The, the, it's generating lots of electricity, making lots of money. The operator is really happy. Along comes B and builds another one in the same channel. So it's just probably half the output of A. So does A have any right to redress? Does B have a liability for A's losses? Don't know right now. In the side-by-side -side scenario, A and B are both enjoying life. But now B breaks down, or maybe B just doesn't perform very well, or maybe B is planned but never built. Now, a lot of the water that would have gone through A is instead diverting through this gap. So maybe there was liability here for absorbing some of the energy that A would have taken, but can B be held liable for not doing something? This is an open question again. Can there be a liability for non-performance? Similarly, A's environmental impact has just substantially increased. So how meaningful is it to do an environmental impact for one tidal farm in isolation when its actual impacts will depend on what else is around it? I emphasize again, this is not something we need to worry about for the current proposals and current consenting. This is when things get really big in the future. There's also a potential, I realize talking about tragedy of the commons is out of fashion, but there is a potential for um, the concept previously known by that name, which I'll explain in a second. Um, this is a modeling done in 2016 by a group at Imperial College. Um, and I don't have a map actually of the area they were modeling, but it doesn't matter. They were modeling an area with four nearby tidal farms in it, farm one to four in this table. Um, and they optimized the um, amount of power these farms were going to take. And they optimized it in two ways. Uh, the fig these are the average power figures for each of the farms. And the figures in the brackets are if they optimize for the total overall profit of all four farms. The figures outside the brackets are each farm being optimized for itself. And the thing I want you to notice is the figure when you optimize each farm for itself is always higher than the figure if you optimize for the best overall total. So this suggests that any one, if, if these are all operated by different companies, any one operator can take more energy and do better for itself at the cost, at the expense of the others, and at the expense of the overall amount of power that would be generated. Of course, if they all did this, everyone would be worse off. So this is not an ideal outcome. We want to try and find a way to avoid this happening. So. What we did is we looked at some possible approaches to management, and most of this work is, in fact, done by Sandy and by his PhD student, Steph, who is no longer here. Um, <clears throat> we reckon there are four things we'd like to get out of whatever management approach we take. We'd like the ability to plan, hol plan holistically, to plan strategically for a whole region so as to maximize the 
power available for a given acceptable level of environmental impact, or to go for the minimum environmental impact for a given level of generation. We think we need forward visibility so that people developing one tidal of farm know what else is going to be built. And that's not just for the reasons of location that we've already discussed. I'm not going to go into the physics of this, but it's also true that the optimum design of your tidal farm will depend on other tidal farms around you as well. We need to discourage people from overproducing the tragedy of the commons scenario that I described just now. And ideally, we need some kind of way of dealing with what happens if my yield is affected by someone else's tidal farm not performing. So we looked at we looked at three approaches here, which is we're not saying these are the only approaches. They're quite a broad spectrum of different ways you can do things. Um, first of all, we looked at a free market approach. Anyone can do whatever they like. Um, I need my notes here because this is not my specialist area. And Sandy might correct me on some of this. So if we're, if we're on land and we lease some land, that land comes with the right to benefit from its resources. Um, in the sea, we're not quite sure because the Crown Estates operator agreements are not public. We don't think that's quite the case. If we have detrimental relationships between multiple tidal farms in a free market situation, well, on land again, if I if I'm on if I'm on my patch of land here with a windmill, and someone else puts a windmill up there that steals wind from it, I might be able to make a claim of nuisance. It's not clear, as far as I'm aware, that that works on the sea, but also it's very unlikely that I could make a claim of nuisance to somebody for not doing something. In the case of another tidal farm that's failing to generate, um, this doesn't give us any holistic planning, and there's no forward visibility from a free market situation. And there's little to prevent people from extracting too much. You might get a bit of that from consenting and from monitoring arrangements, potentially. Um, and compensation in terms of failure to operate, you might manage for a private contracts, but not otherwise. So there are some quite high project risks under a free market approach. If I might build my tidal farm and then find it affected by another one that's built later. So we don't think this does what we need. Not a fan of the free market approach. The second thing we looked at is first come, first served, which is not far off how things are at the moment. The idea being that the first movers are protected and people who build later cannot affect the earlier one, cannot disadvantage the earlier ones. And we do know that the, type, the Crown Estates operator agreements do have this clause saying that future developments won't reduce their yield by more than a certain amount. I should mention those operator agreements are under review at present, so this might all change. So doing this definitely reduces the project risk for the first movers, because if you build first, then you're protected. It does that at the cost of discouraging newer, more innovative, perhaps more efficient solutions that might come later with new technology. And it also prevents more capacity from being built for a greater total output if that's going to have a detrimental effect on the earlier ones. So it's definitely not going to get our optimal results for the region. Still gives us no holistic planning or forward visibility. We do avoid the tragedy of the commons thing because the early the first movers are protected as long as the over extraction can be measured and evidenced, which is a whole different question. Um, again, compensation for non-performance for underproduction would have to be dealt with by private contracts. There's no automatic way that's going to work here. So first come, first served is a bit better, but it's definitely not going to give us what we need. The final approach that we thought about is something called unitization. And this is something that comes from the history of oil and gas. Uh, and again, Sandy might correct me if I get this wrong. But imagine in the early days of oil that you have an oil field which goes underneath the boundary, maybe a boundary between two different landowners, maybe a boundary between two different, two different countries. You can imagine if that happens and both people realize it, they're going to realize they're in a race to extract as much oil as quickly as they can, because whatever they don't extract, the other person is going to extract. That means that 
they are have very high costs for a short time to pull it all out and then the whole market collapses because there's no more oil this is not an optimum result we don't want to be pulling it out as fast as we possibly can when that's faster than anyone can use it we don't want that to happen and they didn't want that to happen so there were various methods tried but what was largely agreed on was a concept called unitization which is where one developer or one operator or one organization will develop all of the wells connected to that same field on behalf of all the owners um, in order to maximize the overall yield of all those wells with a pre-agreed split in the profits. And you can easily imagine how that might be applied to tidal farms. If you have three or four different developers building tidal farms in the same area, you can imagine how one of them might be appointed to operate all of those farms for the best total yield across the whole area with a pre-agreed way of dividing up profits. So that gives us our planning and it gives us our forward visibility because all the developers would be working together. There's a caveat there that maybe if someone decides to come along and build more later, that doesn't apply, but in general, it'll give us those things. Um, the tragedy of the common situation, this overproduction doesn't arise because all of the farms are being managed for the total revenue, which is shared. So it's nobody's interest to overproduce. And if there's a major breakdown and one of the farms underproduces, again, it's in everybody's interest to respond to that in an optimal way. So that ticks all our boxes. So yes, we like that last option, but it doesn't have to be unitization. Um, there are other ways of achieving the same thing. It could be by government intervention. It could be by regulator. It probably, there are probably many other ways of doing it in the private sector. What we do think is that some kind of interventionist centrally planned approach is necessary to use the resource as efficiently as we can. That is, of course, a choice, a political choice. We might decide that actually we prefer a free market and we're prepared to accept less efficient use of the resource. But if we want to get the most energy we can for a given level of environmental impact, we're going to need some kind of interventionist framework. So that's that's the main the main part I want, I want to say today. There are a couple of major caveats on this. Um, the first one is how big actually are these effects? How much does it matter? Um, and the answer to that is, you don't know. Um, the examples I've shown you where people have been doing modeling and shown really major effects, they have mostly been modeling the maximum theoretical amount of power that you could ever get from a channel if money was no object. And we know that no one's ever going to build at that kind of scale because it would just not be economically viable. So in realistic conditions, if it makes 0.05 cent difference to the cost of energy, Probably no one's going to care, and that's totally fair enough. If it makes 10% difference, that starts to be a big deal again, and that starts to be big money. Um, so we've actually been applying for funding recently uh, on trying to investigate how big this effect actually is in more realistic conditions of what people might actually build, you know whether it needs to be looked into further. And the second thing is, if we were going to do this, I'm not a big fan of having regulation or rules that we have no way of enforcing. And if we were to, if we were to holistically plan an area, unless we went to full unitization, if we were to holistically plan an area but have all the operators still working for their own their own benefit, do we have a way of measuring how much power they are removing from the channel? Not how much electricity they're producing but how much power is being lost from the channel. There is no straightforward way at present to measure that, and that would make enforcement quite difficult. So if this is a direction we wanted to move in, that's the direction in which more research is needed. That's all I have to say. Half hour, not disgracefully short, I feel. Um, thank you very much to my co-authors, um, one of whom is in the room, um, but in particular, Steph Weir, who uh, was Sally's PhD student at the time, and did most of the work on the policy side. Uh, I believe she's now with the Scottish government, is that right? Um, and thank you to funders and everything. Uh, and I will now submit myself to questions that are hopefully not too difficult. I'm going to sit down, though. Hi. Um, so I was interested in your modelling. Um, 
when, when you were showing the, the subreddits between the island of tidal devices. Tidal devices come in all shapes and forms. So how does that count for the different effects, the different types of, because some of them are seabed mounted, some of them are mm -hmm. floating. Does how that, does that account for that? Just so I'm more seeing what you're thinking about. Is that this mm -hmm. one, this slide you're talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as long as we're talking about tidal stream and not tidal range, mm -hmm. then the answer is at the scale we're looking at here, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, and any of the tidal devices currently being proposed are much, much smaller than one of the, one of the triangles on that map. And those triangles are the units which are calculated, so to speak. Um, so from the perspective of these models, uh, all it needs to know is this much of the momentum in the flow is being removed from this, this part of the sea. It doesn't matter whether that's being done through something on the surface, something on the seabed, something that waves back and forth, something that spins around, etc. We just need to know how much energy is being removed. There, there certainly is a more detailed analysis, um, in particular looking, as you highlighted, at the vertical aspects. Is it being removed up here or down here? And because you can also get a diversion, as well as going around the tidal, tidal farm, you can get water going above or below the tidal farm, mm -hmm. and that can make a difference. Um, so, I, I, yeah, broadly speaking, it doesn't matter at this scale, but uh, if we were modeling this in more detail, we probably would take account of whether it's floating or bottom fixed. The other thing tying in with that is um, this modeling process um, is focused on the tidal turbines, but it fails to take into account shipping channels and what other things are affected by that, that same area. Um, yes. Well, not quite. Um, so this particular modeling, you're right, totally fails to take that into account. Yeah. Um, and that is one of the things we have to deal with um, is that in most cases, the optimum, the most efficient way of laying out our tidal farm is to, to evenly block as much of the channel as we can. And of course, in reality, we need to leave room for fishing and for other activities as well. Yeah. So we could probably, in, in very few cases, are we ever going to be able to do that ideal layout? Um, so that will always make things a bit less efficient. Yeah, it's just yeah. more of an observation. Thank well, you. absolutely, absolutely right. Yeah, I wanted to ask about what the sort of solidity is of these things. Like, if you look at the Churchill barriers, they're mm -hmm. hundred percent solid. No, no water going through. But what solidity is there in these dive turbines? It is maybe only ten percent of the area covered by the turbines, and ninety percent water flowing by, or that's actually a really interesting question. So an individual turbine, I don't know the figure off the top of my head, but you know what they look like, um, is quite low solidity. You've yeah. got two or three fairly small blades. Um, when people are looking at these theoretical maximum energy extraction scenarios, what they're doing is putting so many turbines in that what we call the actual blockage in the channel is more than 100% sometimes. Um, again, realistic scenarios would not be quite so dense. And so again, we need to do some testing with realistic scenarios to see how that actually works out. Well, the reason I was asking was if it tends to be that a developer will come along and say, this is my turbine and it's got 20 meter diameter blades. Mm -hmm. If you put that in water that's 30 meters deep, uh, it's going to be a different result than if you put it in water that's 50 meters deep. Yes. But if you take a cross section where it is, There'll be bits at both sides that are only a few meters deep where you can't put a turbine in at all. Um, so that that was the first thing. The other thing was I wondered if uh, if there was options for making a channel uh, smaller artificially by filling in those shallow sections near the shore. In other words, like building little. Churchill barriers mm -hmm. out to the point that you can start having a turbine. Yeah, so that's not quite, I guess, not quite what we're talking about today, but I think you, some really, you're absolutely right. Um, again, to get the most efficient outcome, and we probably would never do this for practical reasons, you would adjust the size of each turbine to be fill as much of the vertical space as you could. So you'd have bigger turbines in deeper water, smaller turbines in shallower water. Um, in practice, we might have two or three different sizes, we're not going to adjust each one individually because that wouldn't be practical. Um, and there's always going to be a minimum size where it's not worth putting anything in, in shallow water, like you say. That would always give a route for the water to go around. Uh, now, could we then channelize things? Could we build up vertical walls to avoid those shallow areas? From a civil engineering perspective, I don't see why not. 
Uh, I doubt that it's ever going to be environmentally acceptable to do that. Um, and I don't know how the economics would work out either. Yeah, I, don't know. I was thinking about people talking about fixed links between islands, uh -huh. where you could build a barrier in the shallower section and a bridge in the deeper sections to put a... I think... I, I don't know anything about this. I, I always assume that when people talk about fixed links nowadays, they're talking about tunnels or broadband bridges rather than knocking off channels. I might be wrong, but I think it will be very tough to get the uh, Churchill Barriers part of the environmental impact assessment today. <laughs> from, from, a pure, from a pure engineering perspective, a pure physical perspective, I have no quarrel with what you say. I just don't think it would ever, ever be allowed in this day and age. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, just a quick one, really. Um, it's around the role of like getting that agreement between all the different tidal operators around there. Um, what role? How do you see that actually playing out in practice? Good question. I don't know. Yeah, um, it seems to be starting to play out in the consenting space at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Crown Estate Scotland are doing a piece of work called Tidal Working Group, yep. where they're trying to do the so like the modelling between the different uh, array scenarios, but in really, really, really early days. So I just wonder what your thought was. Uh, I'm aware of the working group and only slightly bitter to not be on it. Um, <laughs> um, I am very glad this is being looked at, honestly. Yeah. Um, because clip, what we're saying here is this needs to be looked at and we need some way of, of having this communication between different developers. Um, so um, the fact that this is, is happening with the Crown State of Scotland is a really good move in that direction. Um, but as you say, it's not a straightforward problem. And there's quite a lot of new knowledge that's probably needed to really do it right. Okay. Um, so um, I think you possibly touched on this in the talk, but has anyone actually looked at the kind of sensitivity to the amount of blockage um, in terms of where these effects become important? Like, do we know ballpark? Um, yes. What that says, yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't really talk about it, but it's a good question. Yes. Um, Oxford University in particular have done a lot of highly theoretical work about this, um, but various other people have done modelling on it. Um, the the generally accepted figure seems to be that this stuff, that we, that we consider an array to be large, or this stuff starts to become significant when the cross-section of all the rotors uh, gets up to about 5% of the total cross-section of the channel, which is quite a lot when you think about it. We think about the size of one of these channels, <laughs> width and depth. Um, you need quite a lot of turbines before that starts to become an issue. So that, that's, that's people guess the point at which we need to start thinking about these things. Um, but I would note that nobody's actually put that much in the water yet, so this is all theoretical or modding-based. We don't have any real-world validation of that. You know, like off the top of your head, what that would be, independent firth or something? or Quite a lot, but independent firth are quite deep. Yeah. Um, I don't, I haven't done the maths though, in terms of how many <laughs> O2s that would represent. Anything else? Um, acknowledging that the C is three dimensional mm -hmm. rather than two. What's the prof profile in speed of the sea bottom compared with the top? Um, generally, this varies from place to place, but generally the bottom is slower because the, the sea feels friction with the seabed. And the top might be slightly slower again because of energy loss in waves and that kind of thing. Um, but gener generally, in, in shallow seas at least, and anything around Orkney, um, generally you get a slower profile at the bottom going to full speed near the top. What, what really? What what difference? Oh, a difficult to answer off the top of my head. Anyone in the room know the answers to that? So about one sixth reduction between the surface and the seafloor. Sounds about right. Yeah. Uh, people model it at different different levels, but one sixth is like a standard number for twenty meters. Thanks. This is one of the reasons, of course, that some people very much prefer floating. Tight turbines, high speed to the top. Simon, I was interested in your unit utilization model. Mm -hmm. Um, and given the issues that there has been with onshore wind, 
and it's not just to do with the consenting it's to do with the manufacturing of the turbines and things like that how that would come into play if you were looking at type of model because the developers wouldn't know when they were deployed so you would never have a sure certainty of who was coming at what time and when to bring them together so i guess if you had adopted unitization and everything mm. was being done cooperatively um I mean, you, you might agree that developer B was not going to get their share of the profits until their farm was installed. That might might seem a reasonable thing. But you could at least, if you knew what was coming but didn't know the dates, then as long as long as you knew it was coming within a few years, not a significant part of the lifetime of your device, then you could still de design your device and design your farm on the basis of optimizing for when everything is in place. And you'd accept that it'd be slightly less efficient for the first year or two until the other farm was built, for example. Does that answer the question or have I misunderstood? Not really. I think the practicality of it. Um, okay. If you think about um, the fact that some wind turbines are proposed and they never happen mm -hmm. for various reasons. So to adopt that business model would be really problematic because some of the arrays might never happen and there's no guarantee whether they would or wouldn't see what you mean and also because the devices can be really really quite radically different mm -hmm. um and the the sort of logistics of the impact of that on the preempt and what the impact of which one's going to be successful or which one's not that's where i'm going with that okay so as the first if something is planned but never actually built mm -hmm. um, that is certainly a problem and it's not easy to see how to deal with that yeah um unless you have some kind of bond arrangement i guess but that wouldn't make financial sense for anybody no um I think, I think that has to be accepted as a risk probably to everybody, unless someone comes up with a very sophisticated way of dealing with it. Um, the issue of not knowing exactly what the design of, the, of the things are going to be, because things change during the development process, that's a fair comment. Um, I guess if you had adopted a unitization model, and if all the developers were thus working together, it would be in everyone's interest for them to communicate and tell each other when things were changing. Um, but you would still have a risk that if developer A was going first and they put something in and then developer B changed their design, then A's might not be optimal anymore. Yeah. Um, so the, I'm sure there will be some wrangling. There, yeah. There's no reason under a unitization approach that you couldn't adjust the shares that people were going to get according to whatever basis. You'd have to have all that agreed, I guess, from a legal perspective, have some method of resolving these conflicts. Um, but yes, um, you could you could only ever obviously design the best you can for the knowledge that yeah, you have. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah, going back to my when I was talking about solidity, I think what you said was that you thought that the the area covered by the rotors, so the circle covered by the rotors was unlikely to exceed 5% of the sectional area of a channel. That, to me, that's that's quite low solidity quite compared what to what... To say. To, ah, right. Um, what I was saying there is it's somewhat, I'm not saying this is certain, but it's somewhat accepted in the literature that when that cross-section of the rotors hits 5% of the cross-section of the channel, above that is when we need to start worrying about these effects. Below that, it's probably negligible. Right, but until you get above that, I, I wouldn't have thought that made much difference to an adjacent farm if you were only covering off 5%. Agreed. So 5% is kind of considered to be the threshold of where we might talk about a large farm. So above that threshold, this stuff might start to become important. Below that threshold, we're fairly confident that it won't be. Ah, I misunderstood what you said then. Yeah. So I, th I think we agree with each other. Yeah, yeah, so okay. A, a low, 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 low blockage, then it's not going to be an issue. Right. So if you have a deep area, like Finland Firth at A, that's maybe 50 metres deep, something like that, um, you, you're unlikely to get a high solidity in the turbine sizes you put in there because you've got to leave room for all the ships to get above them. And if, well, sh if ships are drawing 15 metres, you might have nothing uh, in the top 15 metres of water. That depends very much on what we decide to build and what trade-offs we're prepared to make uh, to get more power. So 
maybe and I'm hypothesizing here I'm not suggesting anything for the pen of further particular but maybe we maybe we as a society would decide that actually we'll leave this uh, six or seven mile gap in the middle for ships and the rest of it we can fill top to bottom with turbines um, or even if we didn't do that um, remember that our total cross section might be built up over many rows of turbines streaming downstream so it doesn't all have to be in one line across the channel right but what, what i was getting at is you're still going to leave a lot of unobstructed channel through a and c and i think d as well mm -hmm. is used by ship big ships that you that you would need to keep clear for you know maybe 15 meters or with the stuff that's coming in with these oil rigs maybe more than 15 meters yes um, I, so yes i mean this this is something i mentioned earlier as well that we almost certainly can't do the most efficient tidal layouts in most places because we have to leave space for navigation and for other purposes for other uses of the sea um and whether that is accomplished by leaving a certain clearance above well that doesn't work if you're using floating turbines but it does potentially with ones that are on the bottom or uh, whether that's accomplished by having an open channel um whichever way we accomplish it as you say there will have to be some unobstructed uh section right well taking that a little bit further then um one suspects the military may want total clearance for their submarines. One suspects they might want that, yes. Um, how to resolve that is not a scientific question. <laughs> I, I will say something more on that, which is that the there's already a conflict between the MOD and energy production with wind farms, I'm sure ones in particular. Um, if you are the MOD, you probably don't like having your radar coverage at about the level of a low flying bomber filled up with wind turbines. So there's already that thing there. The MOD are already a statutory consultee for wind farms, and they do sometimes object and say, actually, because of our radar station, this location, we do not want a wind farm here. Um, I'm sure they would rather have no offshore wind farms. They have, they, they have engaged, and there are sensible compromises being made. So I imagine similar compromises could be made about submarine navigation yeah, just a point on that i don't know if everybody's aware but this last week sweden's pulled all but one of the offshore wind farm applications have been said no to because of the issue about aircraft in the baltic right i i wasn't aware of that actually but that's interesting and one can totally understand why at this point in time they might make that decision um, there are other ways around there's a way to deal with dealing with this, but we're not really here to talk about offshore wind and radar, I guess. Yeah. But, uh, no, it's an interesting point. Thank you. Yeah. Um, are you aware of anyone having looked at the constraints that we already know exist and trying to map that out title? Mm. In the way that it's been done for offshore wind, for instance. What sort of things do you mean? What, yeah, shipping chat. What I guess shipping channels affects stuff that is um, okay. floating, but um, you have to do bird surveys for um, wind turbines and presumably <clears throat> presentations and stuff like that. You need a certain amount of the channel not to be blocked. But do we have kind of maps of that stuff, or is it just completely kind of it, new ground meant... for? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. individual sites have, of course, the same requirements as for any other development. Mm -hmm. um, and we have the existing tidal machines that are out there have had to go through this process. Um, but in a broader sense about how much of a channel is blocked, not so much of an issue when you've got one or three machines. Um, but I, I, I don't know if anyone in the room confirmed, but I'm sure navigational risk assessments will be part of the consenting process for tidal developers. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the broader kind of regional scale, where can we put things? Um, yes, the Scottish Government has maps following basically the same process as with um, offshore wind. They're the same maps mostly. They've marked on suitable locations for offshore wind, suitable locations for waves, suitable locations for tidal. Um, 
I suspect that if we end up scaling up to gigawatt scale or to hundreds of turbines, then we may go beyond those areas because they're very much initial areas mm. that were marked. Yeah, but I, I guess I was wondering if those maps would kind of constrain this at the moment to not being a problem or... Well, in so much as if we <laughs> don't build very much, there isn't a problem. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> but, because you might not be allowed to. <laughs> um, but I don't think the current uh, marine planning uh, is necessarily what would be applied 30, 40, mm -hmm. 50 years in the future when we're reaching this kind of scale. Or well, maybe sooner, we are, <laughs> I hope. Mm. Yeah, the, the, the navigation on this thing that that, that is assessed. Thank you. Um, but, so, um, just uh, you know, we we are looking at multiple arrays on our site, and um, one of the things that we are looking at is um, uh, to make sure that there isn't any problem to people actually going through to Hall of Hornets right. in, with, with the plan. So that that is considered. And it's not my area. It's not I'm not an expert on that bit, but it, but it does happen, and uh, the state are clearly going to be interested as well. Brilliant. I'm glad to have my guest confirmed. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> I was just going to speak to that because I was involved in the marine planning framework for Scotland. Mm -hmm. And we're basically sat in a room with a bunch of consultees and various, um, they were like um, clear uh, sheets of the sites of scientific interest, um, weave, tidal uh, generation, and you'd put them all on top of each other to highlight how, where the the areas would be that they would be using at that time. But f first, work out where we can't put things. Yeah. Then work out out of the remaining space where, where we there. can't. Yeah, it would be really interesting project. It's good. Oh, great! Thank you. Hopefully, answers Paul's question a bit. Um, I think on your first slide, you showed the disruption in the flow. Um. That one or? Yes, that one. Mm -hmm. When you go past uh, an array, how far beyond the array does the sea, uh, sea revert back to its normal state? That's not going to be a question with a straightforward and simple answer. It will depend very much on the sea conditions, on the level of turbulence and transportation and so on. Um, and I'll just see if Richard has a view on this, because you say you were doing some work on wakes recently. Yeah, I'm doing works on wakes for, um, doing works on wakes for um, Orbital Marine Power currently. Um, and it's a simulation of six of their next generation OKU devices um, in the Pool of Warners. Um, and what we see is that the wake of a single one will go out to around about two and a half kilometers downstream. Right. Okay. Um, and it also has a small the kind of depressive effect upstream for a few hundred meters. Um, which, now, which is actually what we see here. Yeah, the upstream a few hundred meters. Yeah, it's quite interesting. The 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 kind of like that effect of B there seems to be from the modelling that it's kind of like almost like kind of like half the width of the array width, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So yeah. we've got maybe sort of uh, about five hundred meters, like either side of it, where you'll see an increase in the speed away from it. And um, one of the things we also do see is. Um, but uh, when they're slack, it kind of changes the eddies. Okay. Yeah, which might have some impact to ecology on the sea floor. Um, it's not a large sort of velocity change that we're seeing. It's um, maybe sort of like um, half meters per second. Mm -hmm. But it's just that the eddies kind of change position. So it looks like a really big perturbation when actually it's kind of not. Um, so there could be some things there. And I, 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 I'm actually kind of... Quite interested in that area because right. um uh when we took out open hydro recently you can kind of see the different species and different mm -hmm. sort of like uh, whether it's flood or whether it's air or whether it's on the path or a, or it's lower speed of the of the, of the thing right. and you'll get that on the seafloor as well so um uh, yeah lots of active research in this area that's really interesting because also and it, it probably won't apply to the fall of one if there's very little sediment there mm -hmm. but in areas that have a bit more sediment if you move the eddies around you might end up moving where the sediment is as well which will again have ecological mm -hmm. effects thank you so, sorry, I didn't catch the distance you said that. It's about the same. It's about the same as the array width, really. Um, so we had um, over the course of about uh, 500 meters to a kilometer in the sort of like across the across the array, six turbines in like three and two rows sort of thing. What you see is about half that width on either side. Again, is where you get that speed increase. Um, so. You were asking about the length of the wake downstream. 
You were saying there was uh, the length of the wake, the length of the wake downstream, it goes out to about two and a half kilometers. Um, you see, they kind of like got this sort of mid range or far range. Um, mid range is about sort of like 400 meters to 800 down, downstream. That's where you'd expect an impact on another turbine. Um, you don't expect that much of an impact on other turbines beyond that, but the actual weights themselves do spin out for a good, good, good few kilometers of those really large um, pearl, pearl turbines. Obviously, if you've got a 250 kilowatt turbine, that can be can be less, right? So, so that, um, that's a figure for the particular turbine. Yeah, but, at. yeah it's, it's just it's a very, very large. It's not on the size of the array. If each individual turbine has a wake, there will be an array, array scale wake as well. Um, yeah, so the, the displacement effect is of the array, what I was saying, about half the width of the array mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the horizontal, in the sort of like the across it. Um, but the actual length of the thing, as we say, it can be up to a couple of kilometers, depending. Um, but of these small devices, it'll be, it'll be less. Any more? What's on the one hour mark? Well done, everyone. The exactly the right number of questions. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you for the lovely questions. Except, except, except. <laughs>